what's the perfect iPhone? You know, hack your own iPhone. They're all going to be another Nokia if they don't change the way of their thinking and about their innovation. Apple, I think, stands to lose a lot of market share, not just in China, but in the United States and all over the world, unless it can keep its status as the curator of the best of the best. The antitrust action taken by the United States against Apple that very possibly could end up with the breakup of Apple. And I think that would be a very unfortunate thing, not just for Apple, but for the technology world and consumers worldwide. And maybe my advice to Tim Cook uh, might be think about moving your headquarters to China. The Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. The Chat Lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way. It was once the epitome of innovation. Last year, for the first time, it became the biggest smartphone vendor by shipments in China, with its market share hitting a record high. But only a few weeks into the new year, there are concerns that it's losing Chinese consumers quickly. Welcome to the Chat Lounge. I'm Tu Yun. Joining our discussion on Apple's outlook in China are... Andy Mock, a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, William Li, chief economist at the U.S.-based Milken Institute, and Dr. Chi Chang, fellow of the Belt and the Road Research Center, Mingzhu University of China. Great to have you all back for the chat, gentlemen. Apple CEO Tim Cook has come to China to revive decreasing interest in iPhones. We'll have more on his latest China trip later. But first, a mini poll. What cell phones are you using? Shall we start with uh, Dr. Chi, please? Well, I have both phones. One is Huawei, another is uh, iPhone. I think both phones have a very different you know, ecology in the uh, APP store, mm. in their payment system, in their you know, uh, pushed information to the customers. So I think uh, if you're an international traveler between China and the rest of the world, I think Apple and uh, Huawei are both necessary. Just one minor example. Uh, when you travel in China, you know, Huawei are using the Beidou satellite system. So their positioning and the map system are working really, really well. But uh, in the uh, America, uh, of course, Apple will definitely have a better performance uh, in the you know mapping and positioning. So I think... Um, it is really, really necessary for you to have both. Right. We've brought up uh, two um, very strong competitors uh, in the very beginning of, of the chat. And what about William? I use an Android, um, ah. and it's a you know, no-name brand Android. Uh, and um, I've traveled around the world, Europe, Asia, uh, and, and have had no problem using it. Uh, I, but I must say, my wife is an avid Apple fan, so we have a split household here. Right. And uh, Andy? So I also have a Huawei phone and a, an iPhone as well, for some of the same reasons as we just heard. Right. Um, but also, for me, it's also because I, I follow technology, I research, and I analyze technology issues. So it's also partly a work issue as well, uh, just to keep up with what's going on in uh, what used to be, uh, you know, the iOS versus Android mm. operating system, but of course, in recent years. Huawei now has its own Harmony OS, uh, which is becoming uh, a rapidly uh, well-established alternative to iOS and, and Android. Mm. Yeah, I, I myself uh, used to be an avid uh, iPhone supporter and have used four or five iPhones before buying a, a Huawei earlier this year. So that says something about the, the general picture in, in this field. And uh, let's go back a, a few months. The, the scenario seemed um, still seemed very friendly to, to Apple. We know for the first time, it, uh, China overtook the U.S. as the largest single market for iPhone sales in the second quarter of last year. As we mentioned earlier, Apple for the first time became the top smartphone vendor by shipments in China, with its um, market share hitting a new high of more than 17%. Andy, it seems totally opposite to Chinese consumers losing interest in iPhones, right? W what prompted the concern? Yeah, well, I think that's a very complex question, and I think there's several factors. So, first of all, there's the geopolitical tensions between China and the United States, and I think this uh, certainly has had an impact on consumer sentiment in China, especially those that have 
uh, more nationalistic feelings and see that the choice of smartphone is a type of political statement. So I think that's certainly one factor. Uh, the other factor that's related to this is that uh, Huawei uh, was out of the market for a couple of years. It had to cleanse its supply chain uh, of American technology components. Uh, but now it's come back better and stronger than before. So with the re-entry of Huawei uh, into the smartphone market, I think with some exciting features, uh, this certainly has increased competition. And these two factors are, of course, related as well, because some, perhaps many Chinese, see buying Huawei again as making uh, a kind of a statement. And then I think more generally, Apple, the iPhone, was the pioneer. Uh, we've reached a sort of, I think, a, a plateau in terms of the form factor, in that every year in the early days of the iPhone, people not just in China but all around the world camped out to get the latest iPhone because they were excited to see what the amazing new features were. Mm. Um, but in the last few years, uh, I think most people would agree that the changes tended to be more incremental versus revolutionary. And I think this also has played a role, perhaps not the most important role, uh, but certainly a factor uh, as well. Right. Andy just uh, uh, gave us some uh, general reasons leading to iPhones appealing as uh, decreasing, probably. But William, from your perspective, you know, uh, there is a big shift, I should say, just in a couple of months on the Chinese market here from being the top vendor to witnessing well, a yeah, decrease let, let, let of me, uh, one quarter and, uh, of it yeah, uh, I, here in China. Right, so what happened? Let me jump in and, 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 and take take what Andy just said, and, and your question about Apple's apparent loss of appeal and luster in the Chinese market. As an economist, I'd like to think that there are more fundamental things at work, right. um, as, and, and, and having to deal with people's incomes and not just uh, a, a, an arbitrary change of taste, but All rather, right. what is it that people can afford now versus what they could afford three years ago, five years ago? And I, I, I actually looked up some market shares of the different brands in China uh, over the last 10 years, mm. and Apple has, has really um, gained quite a lot in the last several years, up to maybe 17, 20% of market share. Um, and what I've noticed was Apple's loss uh, of share down to below 20% uh, is mainly attributed to not to the growth of Huawei, but rather it was Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo, and some of the other cheaper brands. And given how um, the Chinese economy is not doing so well in the post-COVID environment, people are looking for bargains. Right. And and I think they, they're able to find bargains in the lower price domestic brands, um, which gave them more value than even Huawei. So it's not so much the bleeding edge of technology. And, and Samsung, Huawei, and Apple tend to appeal to the luxury goods buyer. And if the incomes aren't high enough to support the, the demand for a growing luxury share, um, it only makes sense that Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo were gaining market shares. And, and you know the number is really in telling. In 2020, uh, Oppo, Vivo, had market shares of say 18, 20%. Now it's close to 20, 25%. And Huawei, on the other hand, uh, dropped from 30% in 2020 down to 10, 15%. Uh, a lot, and, and so Huawei's loss of market share to its own domestic competitors is greater than Apple's loss. Isn't that because of the U.S. Um, you know coercion? Uh, but the U.S. coercion, you know, is just on Huawei and not the other brands. I mean, I, I think, like I said, if you're looking for luxury technology and bleeding edge technology, then yes, you are going for the Apple, Samsung, or Huawei environment. But I think if your income is being stretched and you're needing to replace your phone, you don't need the, the bleeding edge technology. You need something that's practical. Mm. And and the, the lower price brands like Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo give you exactly that. And that's why those market shares have been climbing tremendously over the last two years. Right. And then, Dr. Chi, do you share similar observation or do you agree it's mainly because of the, you know, probably the pandemic um, that has affected um, people's income during this period and people now can barely afford an iPhone? Well, yes, I do think this is uh, one of the problems. But uh, there is some other problems, also very compelling, mm. which is the innovation and creativity of the major companies are slowing down. 
Well, we don't blame them. It's because we don't have fundamental breakthroughs in all kinds of technology and uh, you know notions and concepts of design. Just take a look at the chips. The chips are we're talking about uh, you know seven millimeters, uh, seven nanometers, or six nanometers, two or three nanometers. Yes, it does make the phone uh, run faster. You know, it does make the RAM bigger and smaller. But uh, what's the fundamental changes that I still remember 2007 when Steve Jobs first introduced iPhone to, you know, the rest of the world. Probably a lot of people didn't realize back at that time that it's not a just a phone. You know, uh, we always compare uh, Apple to Nokia, but the Nokia actually built very perfect phone. Mm. You know, uh, by the phone's function, I think there is no one still now, no one can actually go beyond Nokia. <laughs> one battery lasts for a whole week. You can smash, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, nuts, you know, by using that phone. So it's so it's so good, you know, work as a phone. But iPhone is not simply because it's a whole nother thing. Look like a phone. It's whole ecology. It's a whole new brand new of productivity, a new way of entertainment, a new way of monetary policy of payment. You know, so everything changed after iPhone and then all other smartphone. So, but now just take a look at uh, one iPhone after another, and also one Huawei after another. It's nothing new. We just a uh, shinier, you know, faster, and now even worse for the iPhone. You know, iPhone 15 and iPhone 14, which I own, and iPhone 13. It doesn't even look differently. You know, I couldn't even tell which one is which. If sometimes you just move uh, the camera to another position or change the logo a little bit or change the shell a little bit and then you call a new phone and try to you know sell to the customers mm. i think the customers are well if not just about the financial status but they are not foolish you know i wouldn't buy it just for some feature changes in the phone and i spend like another you know one or three a one or two thousand us dollars on that kind of a change mm. i wouldn't buy it similar situation will also you know happen to huawei so i think they're all going to be another nokia if they don't change the way of their thinking and about their innovation. Mm. Right. You all mentioned a uh, varied uh, reasons behind Apple's um, decreasing appealingness, if you will, either on uh, in China or around the world. But uh, I'm wondering which factor has played a more significant role in leading to the current situation, the, the declining competitiveness of its products or the rising strength of its competitors. William, I think you mentioned a lot about Huawei. What's your take here? I, I think the appeal of Apple is, um, as was just mentioned, its ecosystem. The right. fact that it can give you a lot of services other than just communications uh, with, with your friends. Mm. Uh, and, and Samsung is delivering that kind of product, but, but Samsung has lost tremendous market share over the years to right. its Chinese competitor, Huawei. And so all three of these are providing you an ecosystem. Uh, one is more exclusive than another, which is Apple, uh, because Apple has really gotten into quite a bit of legal trouble around the world by having such a large monopoly on the ecosystem of services that it's providing. Now, it says that it's filtering services to provide safety and, and uh, convenience, but uh, you know, the, the, the US Justice Department and, and uh, the EU uh, have a different opinion that, that Apple is just trying to to have a, a monopoly, um, but the Chinese uh, phones are much more open, uh, more of an Android type base where other developers can come in. And so, it, you know, depending on the customer, if you're interested in an exclusive premium uh, set of services that Apple supplies, that's what you're going to buy. But when your incomes are stretched and the unemployment rate is growing high, your job security is not there. You don't need that kind of exclusivity. You want practical functionality. And I think that really explains much of the change in market tastes in China and also in Europe. I think the European market share has gone up because the income security on the part of European customers is, is much more secure than even in the United States, where Apple also has lost market share. So I think um, you know a lot of the a lot of the desire for services depends upon where you are financially, where you see your prospects, and how secure you are and needing exclusive services supplied by Apple that could be substituted in the Android world, but you just don't want to change. Mm. And Andy, as a tech expert, uh, what's your take here? 
Well, I'm not sure there's one particular reason. And I would uh, maybe expand a little bit on uh, what Bill said. Um, we have to recognize, too, that clearly uh, Vivo and Oppo uh, have grown their market share. And some of it, I'm sure, is due to the macroeconomic conditions of some consumers perhaps feeling less wealthy because of real estate or not having as much income. Mm. But these two companies, uh, Vivo and Oppo, actually offer a broad range of phones from entry-level, very inexpensive basic phones to higher-end phones that compete uh, with the iPhone. And I think part of what's happening here, too, is these companies have moved up market to compete more directly with Apple because that's a much more profitable segment. And as we see the technology gap closing, as we also heard that you know these, this industry has matured, so most of the changes are incremental, uh, that these companies are perhaps more inherently Chinese and so are able to better meet Chinese consumer expectations is, is one factor here. So, but I do think there are a number of, of reasons, including the geopolitical ones, the economic ones, right. and the business strategy decisions uh, of Apple's competitors, including Huawei. And Huawei being back in the market, uh, I, I do think is, is a good, is a very important consideration as well. So I don't disagree with Bill, but I would just add a little bit of, uh, of granularity to what he was saying about that. But which one or which factor do you think uh, played a bigger role here? Yeah, again, I don't know that there's any one particular one that is more important. I do see right. that these all matter, and they also have some effect on each other as well. Then, William, do you mean that uh, there's no nothing for Apple to worry about? Because, um, you know, as the economic situation improves, obviously it will. Its market share will definitely go up again. Oh, no, I, I, quite contrary. I, I, I think Apple's got a lot to worry about uh, because it is, you know, it's always been an adopter of the best technology that's out there. And the one thing that everyone's been waiting for is what is Apple doing with artificial intelligence? Mm. How can it make my services on Apple, my search services, my shopping services more convenient, more secure? Uh, and so far, we've heard nothing but silence from Cupertino, from just, you know, there's nothing out of Apple that shows that it is close to uh, giving us some kind of product that would incorporate artificial intelligence, which everyone else seems to be promising to do. Uh, so, so Apple really does have quite a lot to worry about because it has always developed a reputation of adopting the best stable technology that's out there. And now there's a developers conference coming up shortly where everyone's expecting Apple to say, okay, we see the need for AI and this is how we're going to incorporate it into the product line. And un unless they come out with a really good announcement, I think they will suffer a tremendous loss of confidence that they are the guardians and curators of the best technology. And Apple, I think, stands to lose a lot of market share, not just in China, but in the United States and all over the world, unless it can keep its status as the, the curator of the best of the best. This has been the Chat Lounge. When we come back, we'll check out more on how Tim Cook's latest China visit may help revive consumers' appetite for iPhone. Stay with us. Sideline Story brings you all things sports related. The hottest topics, latest events, juiciest stories, all with a very personal take. Subscribe to Sideline Story Podcast for heated sports discussions covering events that are happening in China and around the world. Welcome back to the Chat Lounge. We are discussing Apple's outlook in the world's biggest smartphone market. Uh, to Dr. Chi, Andy just mentioned those reasons, but including the geopolitical ones. To what extent do you think the geopolitical discord between China and the U.S. has affected Apple's sales here? Because you know, a lot of people say cell phone buyers, they don't care that much about politics. Well, I don't think geopolitical turbulence will actually affecting Apple's sales. Actually, 
you know, Apple has been treated, uh, you know, reversely like Huawei has been treated in America. Just take a look at, uh, you know, our president are shaking hands with Tim Cook. Tim Cook is one of the most favorable and popular entrepreneur in China and have been, you know, welcomed by both the uh, government leaders as well as for, you know, the entrepreneur society. So everybody thinks Apple are a great company and Tim Cook as well as, uh, you know, the uh, Steve Jobs are, you know, the heroes in the whole industry. So I think the whole, ne- whole uh, concept towards them in China are very, very positive. And also, if you uh, take a look at the numbers, you find by single brand, Apple is still the number one in the whole Chinese uh, smartphone market. Of course, you cannot compare today's uh, Chinese uh, smartphone uh, you know, business landscape towards uh, like uh, 2009 because at that time we don't have Huawei, we don't have Vivo and Oppo. You know, uh, app, uh, iPhone are just competing with some other counterparts, for example, like Nokia, like Motorola. So it's the whole different story. Mm -hmm. So you cannot say uh, geopolitical conflicts are affecting, you know, uh, iPhone. So if you really want to say, uh, you know, some of the uh, collateral damage done by the uh, geopolitical conflicts, I think it's income and it's the supply chain. It's because, for example, right now, iPhone is the moving son of their uh, production line to India. Uh, where they're going to face a lots and lots of uh, you know uncertainty, political issues, factors, and the corruptions, and also the uh, foul play in the legal system, and also the extra cost in managing all the labor forces in India, and letting alone there are some other technology issues, uh, you know, by putting in the machines and the factories in India, so that can be translated into you know extra cost towards the supply chain of Apple, mm. as well as for you see uh, uh, the geopolitical conflicts right now happening in Yemen. And also the major route of the international shipment has been uh, you know, disrupted. Uh, so this can also be extra cost and affecting people's income uh, in the major markets of the uh, Apple's targets. Mm. So I think if you're talking about the geopolitical conflict, I think that can be the thing. But in China, I don't think this can be a thing. Mm. But uh, there are also some reports, uh, mainly by uh, the U.S. or some Western media, uh, that China banned iPhone use for, for government officials and staff with uh, – state-owned enterprises, and that is at the root of Apple's uh, current problems as well. So, Dr. Chu, what's your evaluation? Well, every country will have their national security considerations because, uh, you know, we're not sure that, uh, you know, the data base and also the uh, uh, the data HQ of the Apple uh, somewhere it is because you can easily switch your zones or territories or countries in an iPhone, for example, can switch your phone to, you know, United States, which means you're not abiding to the Chinese regulation. So you can easily, you know, move your data around. So sometimes out of this consideration, well, certain Chinese sensitive agency or departments have their consideration. But I can guarantee you there is no ban of using iPhone in Chinese government system. Mm. And many uh, government officials, which I know, they all have iPhone. Mm. Uh, as long as they don't use it, you know, to get access to the sensitive information, that's totally fine. And also uh, in America, uh, we do see they have already issued very official document to ban TikTok and a ban Huawei phone, ban Huawei equipment in their office, in their infrastructures, and also in the parameters. Australia the same, Japan the same, South Korea the same. If you want, I'll give you a whole long list of quite a mouthful. Mm. So I think, well, let's to be fair, you know, we all have our considerations, but uh, there is no negative feelings you know, towards uh, iPhone and uh, iPhone and Apple company shouldn't also, you know, to have a hard feeling about it. Right. Andy, uh, Dr. Chi just mentioned uh, Apple's move to to relocate some of its production from China to India. To what extent do you think that may affect uh, Apple's uh, sales here? Well, I don't think it will have a very direct effect, but I actually want to go back to what Bill was saying about AI uh, and Apple. Um, so I would agree uh, with Bill completely that AI is absolutely vital for Apple's future. Right. But I'm not so sure that they're behind the curve on this. because, uh, And I have no information to prove this at this point. But my impression is that they are actually being incredibly disciplined about rolling out AI. And they're doing it in a way that's very subtle and kind of under the radar. And I'll tell you why. 
So last week, um, I met with a former senior executive from OpenAI who was here in Beijing. And we had a very long, detailed discussion about the future of artificial intelligence. And one of the big questions is where will AI reside? So today, you know, if we're using a generative AI app, it's an app on our smartphone or on our computer. Um, but many people, including uh, this former senior executive, believe that the future of AI is actually on the device. So this is important for a couple of reasons. So that if you have AI capability on your phone versus running it uh, on an app that sits on top of the operating system, whether that's iOS, Android, or Harmony. This is much, much more powerful. And in fact, this was a big theme uh, at the um, Mobile World Congress. Uh, that com- Samsung, I think, has already come out mm. uh, with a so-called AI phone. Um, but I think I see subtle signs on my iPhone uh, where this is coming into play, where the real value, I think, for AI is not so much creating text, images, and sounds, uh, but to act as an autonomous agent. So think about if you had a highly competent, motivated executive assistant, you could say, I need to go to New York next week, and your assistant would book the flight, the hotel, the transportation to and from the airport, maybe set up your meetings. And I think this is the future, and this can really, I think, only happen efficiently when AI is at the edge, as they say, or on the device. Mm. And this is the, I think, the future that Apple's working towards. And, you know, I think, you know, what what a lot of technologists say is the best technology is invisible, and it's like magic, right? Mm. When you flip a switch, the light comes on. You don't really need to have this blaring in your face. Look at this amazing electricity, right? The lights will come on if you do this. You just don't care, right? You just want it in the background. Mm. And I think this is really kind of, Apple's design, philosophy, and heritage, and probably the most effective way to monetize uh, AI at scale. Right. Uh, Like uh, William just said, uh, providing the best of the best. But we'll come to the AI part uh, later on in the show, because that's also a very important part of Cook's uh, latest China visit. But going back a little bit to the relocation uh, story. Andy, you said uh, uh, the relocation of uh, some supply chain to India wouldn't affect uh, Apple sales here in China. But uh, to my knowledge, there are a lot of um, consumers saying that they decide to abandon Apple because of that, because of the quality concern. They're saying that, um, you know, all kinds of uh, glitches or, or inferior quality of the India made products. Haven't you heard of that? Uh, I actually haven't, but I mean, if there were, it wouldn't surprise me. So China, of course, is an enormous country. It's a very diverse country. And online especially, it's very boisterous with many diverse voices saying all kinds of things. So uh, I know for sure there are very nationalistic people in China who have turned against Apple because they see it as a way to strike back, attack the U.S., make a statement. Um, So I wouldn't be surprised if there were some people uh, who say that they don't like Apple because of its shift to uh, some manufacturing to India. But I would imagine that this would be, you know, a very, very small minority of people. Because, again, I think most people just don't follow Apple that closely. I mean, this is the inside baseball Mm. part of of Apple, right? I think most consumers read the news headlines, you know, they uh, react to those kind of louder signals and maybe less to these more subtle signals. Mm, okay. Uh, you know, can, can, I, can I jump in sure. here on the same topic? I, Go I, ahead, please. I want to amplify what Andy just said. I, I don't think the move to produce the iPhone or assemble the iPhone in other parts of the world would really affect uh, the market share in China that much. But I think one thing that you should keep in mind Mm. is that Apple's lasting present or gift to China is the development of a huge ecosystem for production of high-tech phones in China. Because where is it that uh, Xiaomi and Oppo and Vivo and, and even Huawei are getting their parts? They're getting it from that huge supply chain that was set up 
when Apple introduced its production in China uh, via Foxconn and, and its subsidiaries and, and its uh, network of suppliers. So I think that the fact that Apple has established itself so strongly in China gives China really a lasting present of a good ecosystem of high quality production of high tech equipment. And that will sustain itself in China and will continue to service China, even if Apple produces more iPhones in India. So, so, so I think um, uh, the, the, the presence of Apple in India may cause quality concerns, but that's up to Apple to make sure that the stuff it sells back in China is uh, at least of the same quality that it had before, because I'm sure that the Indian supply, the producers will be using the Chinese supply chain uh, to, for a lot of its inputs. Mm, I, I think Apple, they've noticed such, um, I think, mood here in China, because they clarified that all iPhones sold in China are, are made in China, not in India. And William, you earlier... Uh, Yuan. Oh, Tuyan, sorry, mm. if I can just jump in and add a bit to that, right. too. I want to share a quote uh, that Tim Cook said um, that I think is, is very relevant here. So, you know, Bill makes the great point that, um, you know, Apple's gift to China was this ecosystem. Mm. Um, but I think there's, there's much less here than meets the eye when we hear Apple moving production to places like India or other parts of the world. And when, when you hear this Tim Cook quote, you'll see why. So he said, it's the partnership between Apple and Chinese companies that really make things happen. We make it where one plus one equals three instead of two. And I'll share just a quick anecdote about Tesla. So China saved Tesla. And when Elon Musk came to Shanghai to negotiate setting up their gigafactory here, he was his main interlocutor was Li Chang, who's the uh, premier now. Mm. And he said, he said, making what he thought was an outrageous demand uh, to uh, Li Chang, who I think was the, the party secretary of Shanghai. Yeah. He says, I would like you guys to build this factory in two years. Because in the U.S., this would be just um, you know, an almost absurd, perhaps, request. And Li Chang's reply was, no, we'll do it in one. And they did it in one year. Mm. So I think for these reasons, no serious technology or manufacturing company that has global scale can afford to not have significant operations in China. That doesn't mean that they won't also have operations in India, in Vietnam, other parts of the world, but that uh, China as a premier manufacturing base is still too important. That's for sure. And uh, obviously, Apple is trying to, or Tim Cook is trying everything he, he could do to at least win back some uh, consumers here on this, um, the world's biggest cell phone market. Um, he was in Shanghai for the opening of China's largest Apple retail store, which is the world's second largest after the one on uh, Fifth Avenue in New York. He also dined with a Chinese entertainment celebrity and met with major Chinese suppliers, including uh, BYD Electronics and Lens Technology. He announced plans to launch the Vision Pro headset in China and to increase investment in research and development in the country. And like um, Andy mentioned earlier. I'm not sure he, he met uh, Baidu's um, leaders personally, but Apple obviously is in talk with, uh, you know, China's tech giant Baidu about incorporating Baidu's generative AI technology into its iPhones and other Apple devices specifically for the Chinese market. So of all these moves we've just mentioned, or something else that I haven't included, which one do you think will have the most critical implications for both the company and China? Uh, maybe Andy? Well, I think uh, Tim Cook's very public support and praise of China is most important because we have to look at this within the geopolitical context where the U.S., the United States government, uh, is really, I think, pulling out all stops to... Uh, suppress and isolate China, mm. um, especially in the technology arena. And we have CEOs like Tim Cook and others as well. So at the China Development Forum, 
uh, the largest contingent of business executives came from the U.S. Right. And I say that they're voting with their feet. So they're doing this in defiance of the U.S. government, who wants to, again, isolate and suppress China. And yet these CEOs are here looking to do business, not just because of the China market, but increasingly to partner with Chinese companies to tap Chinese resources for R&D, for product development, for manufacturing for the rest of the world. And that I think in this way, it shows uh, this um, dichotomy, this growing chasm between what the government, the U.S. government is trying to do and I think what the realities on the ground are uh, in China and with the uh, global business community. And I think this is, the, to me, the most important uh, part of Tim Cook's visit. All right. Uh, Dr. Chu, what's your thoughts here? Well, my thoughts is everything are just excuses, uh, blaming <laughs> the mean? market, blaming, right. you know, environment of the politics and geopolitical uh, turbulences. No, everything are just a, you know, an alibi. The whole thing is, the essence is we do not have technology and a notion breakthrough. And we're not making the pie bigger and we're not making the pie more delicious. So the consumers wouldn't buy it. If I may, I still remember the day that uh, iPhone was officially introduced into China, which it was uh, 2009, uh, when Apple company sent their vice president to China to you know shake hands with China Unicom to introduce uh, official Chinese version iPhone to the market. And I was the English host of the ceremony together mm -hmm. with Shui uh, Junyi, the Chinese host. So I still remember the first time I have an iPhone and uh, I look at the phone, I say, oh my God, that that is something else. That is totally something else. Mm -hmm. If, you know, iPhone or Huawei or Xiaomi, they're going to be defeated. You know, it's definitely not by, you know, their competitors. You know, iPhone is not going to kill Huawei. Huawei is not going to, you know, uh, you know, weaken iPhone cell, nor any, you know, political factors or, or business climate. But another thing, maybe a goggle, maybe a watch, or maybe, you know, uh, implanted, uh, you know, brain chips. You know, that can defeat uh, Apple. And I, th I do agree with my two colleagues, and uh, they are not paying attention. They get too, they get too, you know, complacent. You know, they get so satisfied with their situation. A bureaucracy, if you go to the Cupertino, you will see what is bu bureaucracy. Again, happening in this most innovative and creative company, like several years ago, we've been seeing happening to Nokia. So these are the things that are going to kill them. Uh, they're not adopting AI that quickly. They're not seeing the, you know, the AR or, you know, the metaverse that quickly. So I think eventually they're going to be destroyed by themselves. But hey, who cares? Wax and wane, <laughs> yin and yang, that is, you know, the circle of life. So every company will have their moment, you know, like that. I can't agree more with uh, Dr. Chu that uh, if a company stands on its past accomplishments and doesn't advance the frontier, it stands to lose. And mm. and I think Steve Jobs, uh, you know, told everyone, we, we don't want to ask the consumer what they want. We want to tell them what they'll be needing in the next five years and produce it for them and let them and show them what it is that they really are missing out on. I think those are the those are the the the, the things that made Apple a success story over the years. And unfortunately, Tim Cook is not a Steve Jobs. He's not a, a visionary, and he is a great operations guy. He'll give you high profit margins. He'll give you high efficiency, but he won't give you innovation. And I think that's where we're starting to see Apple suffer. And as much as I would like to agree with Andy, because I, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but to blame Apple's demise in the Chinese market on on the desire of the U.S. government to isolate China, to me, is far-fetched. Um, and I think it's really uh, Apple's fault much more than uh, the U United States uh, government why it is that the Chinese uh, consumer is losing its appeal for the, the, the stodgy kind of technology that Apple's been introducing in the last several years. But are you saying... Can I jump in? <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Sorry, no, 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 this is, this is great. I, I think that we can have a very spirited... Yeah, this is a good uh, aspect. Right. Here. This is a good aspect. Bill, um, Bill I, I actually... Um, I think we're overstating the case here. I think Apple first is nowhere near uh, demise. Uh, certainly, sales have slowed in China. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Um, but certainly they haven't grown as much as they had in the past. 
Mm. But I think this is also just a natural lull. So what we've seen typically um, is that when an important new, and we're here we're just talking about iPhones, not their entire product suite, but when there's a major, major breakthrough sales spike, and you're right, I think that the last couple, 13, 14, 15 uh, iPhones haven't been that exciting. Um, that being said, um, I actually am a huge Tim Cook fan. I think his creativity and his vision actually manifest in different ways because clearly Steve Jobs focused on hardware design. Uh, he turned Apple uh, into, with this very powerful business model of integrated hardware operating system app store, walled garden, uh, that created tremendous value. But what Tim Cook did uh, was said, look, we also have to add services. And this has been an enormous growth driver. When we look at the stock price and look at uh, the uh, Apple's market cap under Tim Cook. It's what uh, hit about three trillion, I believe. So clearly, he's doing something right. And looking ahead, I agree with you that I think if, if what you're saying is that the the smartphone, this rectangular thing we put in our pockets or purses, has matured plateaued, becomes stale. Yeah, I would largely agree. Uh, but I think where Apple is uh, betting on the next big transformative hardware cycle will be the Vision Pro. Mm -hmm. And whether they're right or not, I think we have to see. Uh, but certainly as a business, I think Tim Cook has done an amazing job in, in my view. The Chat Lounge. The Chat Lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way. Yeah, William and uh, Dr. G, I understand that what you just said uh, makes all sense. Visions are important, creativity is important, but we got to, you know, do something pragmatic first, right, on, on the ground. So among all the moves made by, by Tim Cook here in China this time, anything that impressed you probably most that can change Apple's fate, if you will, here in China? Apple's desire to lock in more and more Chinese service providers into the Apple ecosystem in order to trap more and more users into using Apple is is sense is and to me is his uh, desperation of of running out of innovative technological ideas right. and trying to get people to do banking and 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 food delivery and and everything else you can imagine in the apple ecosystem because once you're captured inside the ecosystem it's very hard to drop it because you've got to move all your data into an android or a, a another type of, of of operating system and and that's very hard to do it's very sticky and that's that really is, as as i would agree with andy that's that was uh, tim Cook's genius is to trap its uh, uh, customer base mm. into Apple so that it can't get out. Um, and, and I find that to be uh, discomforting. I've never wanted to go into Apple because I didn't want to buy second-rate services. I, you know, If I pick and choose my own services, I can pick them via any kind of Android device I, I, I can choose to pick up. And once uh, Samsung fails, I'll go to you know Google or, or, or I'll go to some other provider for the hardware and I can mix and match. But again, for those who are the you know lazy consumer that wants to say you know okay do something for me and make sure I get the you know something that's the best of the best curate the stuff for me that's what Apple does so so for people who just don't want to do a lot of searching and they just want to consume Apple's perfect and that's what Apple's done in China they're trying to get a lot of business connections so that more and more businesses will be operating through the um, the Apple ecosystem mm, and Dr. G not no. even. Right. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to Bill after after Dr. Chu. All right. All right. <laughs> Dr. Chu, not, not even, you know, the two labs in Shanghai and Shenzhen or the AI integration with Baidu impressed you a little? No, <laughs> no, not even a little bit because everybody are doing the same thing. Come on, Apple, you're better than that. You never copycat other people. Other people copycat you. You, <laughs> you need to, you know, be yourself. And also but, another but thing is Apple, that Apple is the copycat. Apple is the copycat of everybody else. Mm. <laughs> once they trap you, they, they let them all you get a, go, go to any other copy. Yeah, and also the openness is another issue. You know, what's the perfect iPhone? You know, hack your own iPhone. So every time when I buy an iPhone, well, to be fair, also my Huawei, I hack my own phone. Because all these systems become more and more enclosed and not free, not open. They just want to you know hard sell and push a lot of things to you 
you know, steal your information and, you know, uh, uh, bind you into their services. This is wrong. This is very, very wrong. So they forgot their, you know, uh, the uh, original vision, you know, is to make the most important, uh, to make the most important products, innovative products in the whole world, not just to, you know, add another dollar to their revenue and the Q4, you know, report. That's wrong. Mm. So hack your iPhone, <laughs> you will find yourself, find a perfect iPhone, perfect functionality with the open system you can use. Well, same to the Huawei as well. So if they re really want to, you know, talk to the customers, listen to them, rather than just to pick out, you know, every dollar they have in their pocket, just to be humble and open and start to listen. Mm. That's quite a novel way to decide what you're going to buy. So, Andy, you were saying? Let me respond. Yeah, let me respond to both of these gentlemen. Um, so I, I would agree with Bill that it is a prison. Um, but it is a gilded prison and a very comfortable prison. Um, to Dr. Chu's point, I think it depends on who you are. If you're an investor uh, in Apple, I think you love to see this quote-unquote prison subscription revenue. Um, you know, investors love to see predictable growing earnings. And I think, you know, the real customers in some sense are the investors. Um, and the users of iPhones and MacBook Pros, et cetera, are in a way an intermediary product, perhaps is one way to look at it. But I would say, I would respond to Bill's point that I think actually the services that Apple offers are top-notch world-class. So look at uh, TV Plus, where they're competing with Netflix. Ted Lasso, Foundation, which was the, uh, the Isaac Asimov trilogy that became, you know, they made a two-season so far TV series, mm. uh, News Plus. But the point here, Apple Wallet, you know, where if you go around the world, Apple, the iPhone really has be become WeChat in that in China, WeChat is the remote control for our online and offline lives. Mm. But in the rest of the world, not so much in China, but the rest of the world, it's, it's your iPhone. Uh, you can use it to pay for anything. Uh, you can uh, pretty much you know, track your health, be entertained, play games, watch TV, read news. And yes, it is a kind of a prison, uh, but nothing delights investors more than this. So. <laughs> I'm going to remember you said this, Andy. I'm going to repeat this in the future. <laughs> sure, please. <laughs> right. Either you innovate and be disruptive or you get replaced. I think if Dr. Chi mentioned uh, uh, Nokia earlier in the show. So ever since Steve Jobs passed away in, in 2011, people have been asking if Apple could become the next Nokia. So what would be your prediction? I know some of you might not be that um, pessimistic or even optimistic about Apple's future. So um, William? I, I think Nokia's business model is completely different. Um, Nokia mm -hmm. really tried to produce all sorts of models for all sorts of people. Right. It, it was uh, uh, an open kind of uh, assembly of, of devices for each market share, uh, segment, whether it's the luxury, super luxury brand down to the, p the pedestrian level. Uh, whereas I said, said earlier, uh, Apple has really exclusively gone for the bleeding edge of, of, of um, of luxury users uh, who are who are willing to be captured by uh, someone who gives them a cachet of quality. So, so if I can have a name brand carrying around, everyone says, "Gee, you are an Apple user. You must be really rich, and you must be really smart." Uh, then people go for that. So, I think the market segments for Nokia and Apple are totally different. And I don't think Apple will ever become a Nokia because it wants to be the Louis Vuitton mm -hmm. of the of the uh, smartphone world. Right, Dr. Chu. So I think in the future, or oh, just take a look, eventually I think uh, Apple is going to lose their glorious the charm and uh, all the shines. Um, they become a mediocre giant like IBM, like GE. You know, uh, it's going to be there. It's going to still be a very successful company for sure. Uh, very good performance, is very st uh, stable, you know, financial status. Uh, people are going to love them. But uh, they're not going to be the pillar in the stock market anymore. So, for example, like the uh, like the tobacco companies, like the oil companies, like the IBMs, they used to be the ones, but now they're not. Even though they're still very strong and uh, very good companies, 
So in a future, uh, probably some some other companies invented by Elon Musk or uh, some um, younger Elon Musk uh, or Jensen Huang. You know, I think uh, Nvidia have such uh, very good potentials. So maybe in the future, you know, uh, you probably will carry a box which is empowered by the Nvidia and also you have the chips in your brain. And when they two hooked up together, you will have extra uh, calculation capacities to help your brain go. And then you wouldn't need a phone. You know, you can send the radio waves uh, through your own ears and you, know, you can make calls in your own head. Mm -hmm. So that can be the thing, can be the future change, the fate of the company like Apple. And Apple can be a dinosaur or they can burn themselves into oil and make some, you know, something new out of it. So who knows? Right. Andy, is um, Apple going to face a, a Nokia moment? Well, I think that probably won't happen because, again, uh, Apple's revenue streams are pretty diversified. It's not just hardware right. um, services. So I think that if Apple were to fade into uh, irrelevance, it would fade, not collapse. Um, and again, I think a lot depends on whether they're able to uh, catch this uh, next technological transformation, which I think most people would agree is AI driven. Um, but, you know, whether that's the world of apps or is it AI on the device, I think uh, we have to see. But um, again, I wouldn't count Apple out. So you've already pointed out um, the problems with Apple or come up uh, with some suggestions. But uh, lastly, w would you please, um, you know, sum it up for Tim Cook? W what would you say to him for Apple to, to hold on tight to the Chinese market or push back its Nokia moment if there is one as late as possible? Maybe we start from Andy. Well, I'm not so concerned about the technological future for Apple. I think my big concern, and it's actually a very big concern, is the antitrust action taken by the United States against Apple that very possibly could end up with the breakup of Apple. And I think that would be a very unfortunate uh, thing, not just for Apple, but for the technology world and consumers uh, worldwide. And maybe my advice to Tim Cook uh, might be think about moving your headquarters to China. Right. William? L actually, um, let me close by uh, by agreeing with Andy um, right. that that uh, Tim Cook really has to worry about the antitrust uh, of the movements of the uh, United States Justice Department as well as the European uh, uh, commissions. Uh, be and, and my advice to Tim is, you know, you can solve your problems with these difficulties by opening up your ecosystem, by allowing more competition to come into and more access into your ecosystem so that more and more suppliers can supply services without your putting up this monopoly wall. And as far as China is concerned, um, you know, I think the best thing you can do for China is find a good replacement for yourself. Mm, think out of the box. And Dr. Chu, please. I think you really need to localize in China. Right. Uh, you know, get close to the Chinese market. Don't get me wrong, they have, the, uh, they have a huge presence in here, but actually their essence is not here. For example, you know, live streaming is a very important industry in China right now, right? So if you are trying to, you know, give tips to the, you know, uh, the influencers or performers online by using the Android system, when you pay, they immediately get, get the, their funds. But if you use Apple system, usually the money well goes to the center, financial center in America. And then after three or six months, you get your money back. Uh, you know, to the performance pockets. Mm -hmm. So this is just a one teeny tiny example shows how, you know, not localized of Apple system in China right now. And there are hundreds of millions more examples than this. So if you really want to win this market, you need to stay in this market and go deep into this market. And I, I suggest you stay humble, stay hungry, and also start to listen. Mm -hmm. Seems we got some consensus here. Better localization, though it's not something new. And on that note, we've come to the end of our chat. Many thanks to Dr. Chi Chang, a fellow of Belt and Road Research Center, Minzu University of China, William Lee, Chief Economist at the U.S.-based Milken Institute, and Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, for sharing your time and insights. The show is available on all major podcast platforms. If you've got any comments, please email radio at cgtn.com. I'm Tu Yun. Thanks for listening. We'll have more chat at the Chat Lounge next week. 
Dunhuang. Situated along the ancient Silk Road, where fine arts and divine beliefs merged with the natural world. It's where the East and West interacted and where the world's largest Buddhist art gallery still fascinates and amazes people today. A place where stories of life and death, love and hatred, passion and desire, faith and sacrifice have been generated and told for 2,000 years. Buckle up for our new podcast, Why We Love Dunhuang, the one and only podcast that can take you to the fantasy world of Dunhuang and beyond through our audio tour. Listen and subscribe for free on major podcast platforms. Why We Love Dunhuang? You will have your answers.